right is Mr. George Coupe, an IBM engineer who spends five to six months a year in St. Lucia, who's a close friend of mine and who I think has a very good contribution to make today. So on that score, we are going to start our program at this time. Um, George, um, welcome to my program. Um, I've been talking to you on many occasions concerning economies in the world. You have lived, you have been, you, you're educated in France, you've lived in France most of your life, you're familiar with what goes on in Europe. And one of the reasons, one of the areas that have interested me most for quite some time is your take on the economies of the world, the progress and the deterioration of those economies. We have spoken at length on the difference between France and Germany. Both countries carry a well-educated um, workforce. But by the same token, uh, for some strange reason, Germany seems to hold its head far above the other countries. And the discipline in Germany apparently is what makes the difference. Um, Mr. Holland who, as we know, is a socialist, has just got into power, and significant taxes have been put during a recessionary period. And from what I understand, the situation in France is not very comfortable this time. Can you give me your views on the matter? OK, Michael. So, first of all, I, I have to say that English is not my mother language, so the audience will forgive me for s some misuse of words or verbs. Okay, about Europe, and particularly France, I know, we are, with Germany, we are the country uh, found, founder of the European Union, and we are the two countries leading the European Union now. Um, of course, we would like to make the comparison between Germany and France in terms of uh, taxes, in terms of uh, cost of labor, in terms of uh, uh, political situation. For example, Germany is uh, producing cars and uh, good manufacturing goods because they want to aim um, the top of range in the market. As you can see, they are on the Chinese market, they are on the world market. And that is the result of years of discipline. That country is very disciplined and order. There is also another thing I should mention. The position of the unions in Germany compared to France. In France, the unions are always fighting against any decision that the government can take. Everybody in the world knows the number of strikes we had in the past. In Germany, the unions are helping. They are part of the producing system and they're helping the government, they're helping the manufacturers to succeed on the market. That, that is very important because they are part of the success of Germany on the worldwide markets. Another thing is about taxation. The level of taxation in Germany 
compared to uh, France is around 10% uh, less. I will tell you, I have the figures here about the expenses, the general expenditure for France, which are 57% of the GDP compared to 44 for Germany. And another thing which is important is the growth of the public expenditure in the past years. From 2007 to 2012, it has been a growth of 16% in the expenditure. At the same time, it was 12.6 in Germany, 7.1 in Italy, for example, and an average of 14% in the European countries. When an employee it gets 100 euros in France, the employer has to spend two th uh, 230 euros compared to 200 <coughs> sorry, 210 in Germany. For the French employee, the social charges represent 88% of his contribution compared to 65% for the German employee. So you see all that adds up. Yes, of course. Now, just to stop you for one moment, George, let me just touch with Richard. Um, we have a situation where in St. Lucia, the new VAT has been implemented and there's a big hullabaloo in St. Lucia about the VAT situation. But we all appreciate the fact that government needs revenue to operate. But my take as a business person is that although the VAT has its role to play, I get the impression that the burden of producing money has now been offloaded onto the business sector and who are already carrying a burden and some of us can in fact do it, but the weaker ones cannot. Hence the reason why we see a collapse in many of the smaller entrepreneurs on the island who are now faced with this tax burden. They have A, have not been accustomed to, and B, cannot handle in an economy that's kind of low. Now, based on what George has said, Richard, how do you relate those matters to St. Lucia? Well, uh, you know, as I've said before, you know, St. Lucia's overall level of taxation is not that bad in comparison with other countries in the rest of the world. Our um, taxation revenues and, and, and other revenues is about 24% of our GDP. Um, our main problem is that our expenditure is higher, and that's what has been causing the problem. Um, that was introduced as a replacement tax uh, uh, to replace consumption tax because governments of the present government and previous governments um, were told that essentially with what was happening in the world that consumption taxes and duties were going down and that there would be a revenue, there would be stress in the revenue, they had to have a replacement. They were advised that that was the answer and that the rate was 15%. Now, I don't know if you've seen the recent article by, by um, Delisle Worrell, the, the, the um, president of the, or the, the head of the Central Bank at Barbados, who strangely enough, well, actually not strangely, because he's quite an outspoken person, said that VAT is in fact not an appropriate tax system um, for the Caribbean. And the reason why he said that is the theory of VAT is, is good for productive sectors in the sense that it says that the, the VAT that you pay on goods that you use in your production, you can in fact deduct from the VAT that you have to charge um, and pay, and that's passed on to the consumers. So for export industries and for big businesses that are manufacturing, um, you know, it's a flow through and it does not burden them. Um, but what he was saying was, in, in fact, in the Caribbean, we actually don't have that much manufacturing and that much export business. So as a result, it was not that appropriate. And he felt that the impact on tourism in particular um, was, was harmful. Uh, and so that, that was quite a stir in Barbados, who has done quite well in their VAT. But I think it's not the businesses over here that bear the burden. 
I'll tell you who does bear the burden. First of all, it, it, it flows all the way through to the consumer. So it is the average, it's a consumption tax. Yeah. And so it is, at the end of the day, uh, passed on to the average consumer um, who will, does not have a chance to take a credit on the VAT that he pays, whereas a big business can take a credit and deduct it so he, he doesn't actually, does not cost him that much money. Um, the ones that, that feel the impact, first of all, tourism, because tourism, even though it has a lower rate of VAT, the VAT that they pay, they can deduct that from the VAT that they eventually charge. Sure. But tourism doesn't have the luxury of passing on its cost to the end user. That's right. It is constrained by what the market will say we are prepared to pay for a room in St. Lucia based on the services you provide. So in many instances when it comes to VAT, as it was with HAT, um, the hotels essentially have to absorb a lot of these taxes themselves. Yeah. The other person that gets the burden is the small business person because that small business person who is under the threshold of $180,000 does not register for VAT. They can, yeah. but they don't yeah. necessarily. And yeah. so therefore, the VAT that they pay, they can't deduct. That's right. So now they have a higher cost mm -hmm. and their goods are costing more money. So at the end of the day, the real impact, um, you know, in Europe, uh, most of them have uh, uh, value added tax. And in some cases, the rates are a lot higher than ours. Mm -hmm. Some are 20, 30%. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a social contract where governments are saying, we want to give you, the citizen, a certain basket of benefits. And that's going to cost X dollars. So we are going to charge you tax so we can have that money, so we can give you cradle-to-grave services. We can give you unemployment insurance. We can give you health insurance. Um, and we can allow you to work 35 hours, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these islands don't have that luxury. And we don't have unemployment insurance, we don't have health insurance. So governments, be, therefore, uh, cannot, um, because they don't provide it, um, you know, they don't need that level of taxation and should really be in a position to operate even possibly at lower levels of taxation um, as long as they keep their expenditure down. And I think all the governments now in the region are realizing that part of the problem is the cost of public expenditure, mm -hmm. uh, of which 50% are salaries and wages. And, and that has to be dealt with um, before they can actually get to the point where they can safely say they're balancing the books, they're putting money towards capital expenditure, they don't have to borrow as much, and they can still provide at least a basic level of services to the consumer in the country. I have a question for you. Um, I fully understand what you said, but let me give you another take because a business community is made up of different sectors. Take for instance my business. I'm in the real estate business. I have shopping centers and I rent to middle income people. And I pay an exorbitant amount of VAT monthly. That, those monies are derived from small entrepreneurs and middle income owners. And in my case, I cannot deduct much at all because I'm not building at this time and I have no way of getting back that VAT. So it's a vast amount of money which I'm taking from the small person and transferring to the government through the VAT process. The problem that exists is that whereby 15 years ago, when I rented and I was able to get the clients going, I was enthused by taking this money and developing the country by building more. Hence the reason why we built several buildings, we built the shopping centers, which gave people a new life, but I cannot do that today. As a matter of fact, you take one of our shopping centers. In 18 years, I never lost a tenant. Two years after that was implemented, I lost 31 clients, okay? And the people who have come on stream, I have to rent for them less than half of the going rate, and additionally, they cannot even pay that half. And sometimes I have to pay their electricity, pay their VAT, and getting no rent. Now, how much longer as a business person am I prepared to put up with that? The answer is, I'm not prepared to put up with it. And if persons like myself and others, who were the ones doing all the construction, stop, 
you see the domino effect is going to be that there will be no additional business going on, the sales of building materials will drop, and the small people who couldn't afford to have a decent place will not be able to operate within a viable environment. Now, based on what I'm telling you, this is my experience and this is factual, what would you say about that? Well, there are a couple of issues there. One, one is that, that part of the problem that, that you know, your, your clients are faced with is not just the increase in certain costs because of tax reform and, and that. It is also the, the decline in public consumption because the economies have been in recession. We've had two years of decline. And clearly that impacts everybody. And so a lot of people have had to you know, reduce their level of expenditure, even in basic goods. And so these small um, folks that are renting from you, clear, you know, they have a reduced level of sales. And so if you have to pass on that on the rent, and they're not, if, for example, they're not even registered for VAT because they can't charge VAT on their sales, they absorb the VAT and they are in a financial bind. And so that, you know, that's one, one of the areas, as I said, where smaller business is yeah. clearly affected by VAT. And there doesn't appear to be an obvious way of, of dealing with that. You know, sometimes it, you can, they say you can, you, can, you can register for VAT and you can be able to at least claim it back. But that means you've got to put VAT on your sales. And what they're saying is they can't increase their sales, right? It's already maxed out. People will want to go somewhere else. They'll go on, you know, they'll go abroad to buy stuff. So that's one, that's one aspect of it. And I don't know that there's an easy answer because the only answer to that is if we get growth back in this country, then public consumption will increase and people will be able to buy more. And so they won't have a problem even with a higher price of goods. The other aspect that you brought up that is interesting because that is not, a, is, is not should never be seen as a static piece of legislation. And it should be reviewed at all times. And there are aspects of it that can change. For example, in the recent budget, that was removed from medicines. So clearly, it's an indication where the pub, there was a public outcry. And the feeling was there was a need to remove that. And it was. Similarly, we have that on the sale of commercial property. So that if you wanted to, do, to get into a business where you could buy something, build something, and then sell it, and it would be used as a commercial, you would have to pay that in that, or charge that in that. That shouldn't be there because we have learned that construction is the biggest producer of growth and employment. Definitely. And so if you have constraints because of the increase in price uh, on, on this commercial type of activity, there's going to be a problem. So I think that the VAT um, has to be revisited regularly and, and changes have to be made where it is very clear that the imposition of the tax is not bringing in a lot of money because and people have stopped doing that. Yeah. But at the same time, mm -hmm. that reduction in that activity is affecting the economy. Right. So what I'm saying is there are reasons why they had to introduce VAT. Um, you know, we have a high rate of compliance, which is good. But people are hurting because the economy is down. VAT has had an impact on that. Um, and we need to look at how we can fix all of our legislation from time on a regular basis um, to deal with those sectors that are badly hurt. This has been a very important sector of discussion and when we come back we are going to deal with the taxation towards the hotel industry which is very much in the air at this time. This is Open Mic, we'll be right back.